San Francisco in the Roaring Twenties is a city that hasn't quite shaken her old self. Scratch the surface of civilization and out pumps the hot, chaotic blood of her Barbary Coast days. Sometimes somebody needs help bringing order back to this chaos, and that's where I come in. I work for the Federated Detective Agency. Sixty-three Audio and Rocket Eighty-Eight Productions present Adventures of the Federated Tech, created by Pete Lutz and Mark Slade, and adapted from stories by Dashiell Hammett. Tonight's story: The Gatewood Caper, dramatized by Pete Lutz. your own sweet time getting here, didn't you? I called your office a half hour ago, and I instructed my staff to admit you immediately. Yes, sir. I guess that's why it took only 15 minutes for me to thread my way past the doorkeepers, office boys, and secretaries out there. Never mind that! My daughter was kidnapped last night! I want the son of a bitch that did it if it takes every cent I got! Tell me about it. Audrey left the house on Clay Street about 7 o'clock last evening, telling her maid that she was going out for a walk. She didn't return overnight, but I didn't find out about that until I read the letter that came this morning. What did it say? That she had been kidnapped, and the ransom was $50,000. Did you receive the letter at home? No, it came to me here at the office. I telephoned home immediately and was told that Audrey's bed had not been slept in last night, and that none of the servants had seen her since she left for her walk. Are you sure it isn't a hoax? Of course I'm sure. Do I look like an idiot? They sent proof. A lock of her hair, a ring she always wore, and a note in Audrey's handwriting. What did that note say? It was brief, asking me to comply with the kidnapper's demands. I've already turned everything over to the police. Oh. But I wanted private detectives on the job as well, so I called your agents. What can you tell me about your daughter's associates, friends, habits? I don't know anything about those things. Now go ahead and do something. I'm not paying you to sit around and talk about it. What are you going to do? Me? I'm going to put those bastards behind bars if it takes every cent I've got in the world. Sure, but first, get that 50000 ready so you can give it to them when they ask for it. What? I've never been clubbed into anything in my life, and I'm too old to start now. I'm going to call their bluff. That's going to make it lovely for your daughter. It's the wrong play, Mr. Gatewood. 50000 isn't a whole lot to you, and paying it over will give us two chances that we haven't got now. One is when the payment is made, a chance to either nab whoever comes for it or get a line on them, and the other when your daughter is returned. No matter how careful they are, it's a cinch that she'll be able to tell us something that'll help us grab them. I never heard anything more preposterous in my life. Now listen, I'm calling the shots here, and I think you guys are on That was Mr. Harvey Gatewood, president of the Gatewood Lumber Corporation. You may already have deduced by the tone of his voice that he was a big bruiser of a man, more than 200 pounds of hard red flesh, and a czar from the top of his bullet head to the toes of shoes that would have been size 12s if they hadn't been made to measure. Our conversation didn't go exactly as smooth as you heard it a minute ago. He wanted results, not questions, and was more interested in getting answers than in giving them. I wasted the better part of an hour getting information that he could have given me in 15 minutes. Mr. Gatewood had made his millions by sandbagging everybody that stood in his way, and the rage he was burning up with gave me the idea that the Federated Detective Agency was going to lose a client because he was either going to tell me what I wanted to know or I was going to chuck the job. As you heard, I eventually got the story out of him, and I hoped he'd seen the wisdom of paying the ransom before it was too late. At the Gatewood residence, I found butlers, chauffeurs, cooks, maids, upstairs girls, downstairs girls, and a raft of miscellaneous flunkies, enough servants to run a hotel. The girl's maid was the one I most wanted to talk with. No, sir. Miss Gatewood didn't receive any calls or notes before she left. She told me she'd be back in an hour or two. Were you alarmed when you discovered she hadn't returned home that night? No, sir. Miss Audrey did pretty much as she pleased, always has, since her mother's death. 
She comes and goes to suit herself, and she and Mr. Gatewood never really hit it off. I'm not surprised. Hmm? Oh, anyway, Mr. Gatewood seldom knows where Miss Audrey is, and there's nothing unusual about her keeping out all night. She'll come home and announce afterward that she spent the night with friends or something like that. What was she wearing when she left the house? Um, a light tweed skirt and jacket, a silk shirt waist, buff colored, with dark stripes, brown wool stockings with low heeled brown shoes and a gray felt hat. I wrapped up the interview by collecting a handful of photos of the girl and looking through her rooms. She had three on the third floor. Audrey Gatewood was 19 years old, but looked several years older, about five feet five and slender, blue eyes and brown hair, very thick and long. The maid said she was pale and very nervous. The photo showed that her eyes were large, her nose small and regular, and her chin obstinately pointed. She wasn't exactly beautiful, but in the one photo where a smile had wiped off the sullenness of her mouth, she was at least pretty. In her rooms, I found nearly a bushel of photographs of men, boys, and girls, plus a great stack of letters, signed with a wide assortment of names and nicknames. I made notes of all the addresses I found. After dropping in at the agency to hand out the names and addresses to three other operatives and instructing them to see what they could dig up, I met up with Ogar and Thode, the police detectives assigned to the Gatewood case, at the Hall of Justice. A post office inspector named Lusk was with them. Yeah, Gatewood gave us a pretty hard time of it. Didn't want to listen. Wanted to put the whole thing in the newspapers. Offer a reward. Publish photos of the girl. Naturally. That's the most effective way of catching the kidnappers. But... Yeah, but if these boys are tough eggs, it'll go hard on the daughter. And kidnappers, as a rule, ain't lambs. So it's agreed. No publicity, keep things close to the vest until the girl is safe? Yup. Gatewood said he gave you the letter they sent. Yeah, here. Take a look. Looks like standard ruled paper. Could have been bought in any stationery store in the city or in the world. Envelopes the same way. Let's see what they had to say. The letter was printed in pencil, and the envelope was postmarked San Francisco, September 20, 9 p.m. That was the night she'd been seized. The letter was peculiar in that, unlike most ransom notes, it wasn't written with the usual pretense of illiterateness. After establishing the monetary amount and further instructions for Mr. Gatewood to have the cash ready in $100 bills, it read... We beg to assure you that things will go badly for your daughter should you not do as you are told or should you bring the police into this matter or should you do anything foolish. $50,000 is only a small fraction of what you stole while we were living in mud and blood in France for you and we mean to get that much or... The last sentence was left unfinished and was signed only with the word three. Like I said, it was a peculiar letter. Almost always there's an attempt to lead suspicion astray. Perhaps the ex-service stuff was there for that purpose, or perhaps not. After a postscript that described how a Chinese person they knew would buy her if Gatewood wouldn't listen to reason, there was one more page with a short note, written jerkily and apparently with the same pencil. Daddy, please do as they ask. I am so afraid. Audrey. I barely had time to digest these last words before a door opened at the other end of the room. Ogar, Thode, Gatewood just called up. Get up to his office right away. She just phoned me! All right, Mr. Gatewood, calm down and tell us about it. She, she, she called me on the phone and said, Oh, Daddy, do something. I can't stand this. They're killing me. I asked her if she knew where she was, and she said no, uh, but I can see twin peaks from here, and there's three men, and a woman, and and then I heard a man curse, and a sound as if he'd struck her, and the phone went dead. I tried to get Central to give me the number, but she couldn't. It's a damned outrage the way the telephone system is run. We pay enough for service, God knows, and we should... In sight of twin peaks, there are hundreds of houses that are. Have you people done anything at all? Have you got the money ready? No, I won't be held up by anybody. It sounded to me as if Gatewood was finally thinking of his daughter's safety instead of just his fighting spirit. So Ogar, Thode, and I went after him hammer and tongs. And finally, he sent a clerk out for the money. While we waited for his return, we decided how to split up the field. Thode, 
You take some men from headquarters and see what you can find in the Twin Peaks end of town. Alrighty, but I ain't exactly optimistic. The territory's too large. I know, but we have to check it out. Lusk, you and I can stay here, mark the bills when the clerk gets back, and then stick as close to Mr. Gatewood as we can without attracting attention. Fine by me. All well and good for you fellas, then. I'll go out to the Gatewood house and stay there. Mr. Gatewood, do you understand what you'll need to do once you hear from the kidnappers? Yes, follow their instructions. To the letter. To the letter. All right, then. Let's split up. Nothing happened at the Gatewood residence all that evening. Gatewood paced and drank whiskey until midnight when he went off to bed, complaining loudly with a bold lot of detectives he had sitting around like a bunch of mummies. I sat down on a library couch right next to a telephone that had an extension in Gatewood's bedroom. Along about 2.30, the phone rang. Yes, this is Gatewood. Got the dough? Yes. Good. Wrap a piece of paper around it and leave the house with it right away. Walk down Clay Street, keep it on the same side as your house. Don't walk too fast and don't stop. If everything's all right and there's no elbows tagging along, somebody will come up to you between your house and the waterfront. They'll have a handkerchief up to their face for a second, then they'll let it fall to the ground. When you see that, you'll lay the money on the pavement, turn around, and go back to your house. If the money isn't marked and you don't try any fancy tricks, you'll get your daughter back in an hour or two. If you try to pull anything, well... Remember what we wrote you about the Chinaman? You got it straight? <laughs> yeah. Mr. Gatewood, you do as you're told and don't try any foolishness. I'm going out to tell the others. All right, fellas. Gatewood just got the call. The meet will be on Clay Street before he gets to the waterfront. How many men do we have and how many cars? There's you, me, Thode, and Lusk, uh, plus two more plain clothes men. So, six. Two cars. Okay, here's how we'll do it. Clay is paralleled by Washington Street and Sacramento. Ogar, you take one of the machines down Sacramento, and Thode, you drive down Washington. Drive slowly, keeping pace with Gatewood. Stop at each cross street and watch him pass. What if he don't cross? If he fails to cross within a reasonable amount of time, swing over to Clay Street and act according to chance and your own wits. Fair enough. What about the postal inspector? Inspector Lusk, you'll pretend to be mildly drunk and wander ahead of Gatewood a block or so, all the while keeping your eyes and ears open. All righty. My grammar school training will come in handy for the first time. Eh? Played a tree in a third grade production. Then I chose the right man for the job. Now, I'll be shadowing Gatewood down the street, and one of you plainclothes men will be behind me. Our remaining man, you? Okay, I want you to get to a police call box and put in a call to headquarters to send every available man to Clay Street. Won't that be a waste of time? Yeah, they'd all get here too late. Fellas, you'll get no argument from me on that, but we have no way of knowing what's going to turn up before the night is over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll say. Sounds good. Now, I know we have a sketchy plan, but it's the best we can do. We can't just grab whoever gets the money from Gatewood. Also, the girl talked with her father on the phone, and she made things sound desperate. Too desperate to take any chances on going after them until she's out of their hands. Okay? Now, here comes Gatewood. Lusk has already staggered off. Fine, I hope he doesn't overdo it. Okay, the rest of you chaps, mount up and let's get going. With the plainclothes man about a half block behind me and on the other side of the street, I gave Gatewood a two-block lead, so whoever came for the money wouldn't tumble to me. A little ways down Clay, a little chunky man in a derby hat came into sight, but he passed my client and then me and went on. Three more blocks, a large, black, powerful touring car came up from the rear, passed us, and went on. Possibly a scout, so I scrawled its license number on a pad without taking my hand out of my overcoat pocket. Another three blocks and a policeman strolling along in ignorance of the game being played under his nose, then a taxi cab with a single male passenger. I wrote down its number two. Four more blocks with no one in sight ahead of me but Gatewood. I couldn't see Lusk anymore. Suddenly, 
Hey, Louise, come down and open the door for me, eh? Just ahead of Gatewood, this man had stepped out of a darkened doorway, but then he turned around and called to an upstairs window. Gatewood kept going, and so did I. Then, out of nowhere, stood a woman on the sidewalk, 50 feet ahead of Gatewood, a handkerchief to her face. It fluttered to the pavement. Gatewood stopped, standing stock still. I could see his right hand in his overcoat pocket, lifting the flap of the coat slightly, and I knew the hand was gripped around a pistol. For perhaps a minute, he stood like a statue. Then his shoulders slumped, his left hand came out of its pocket, and the bundle of money fell to the sidewalk in front of him. My client turned abruptly and began to retrace his steps homeward. I didn't follow him. My eyes were on the woman. She recovered her handkerchief and scooped up the bundle from the sidewalk. I saw her scuttle to the black mouth of an alley a few feet distant. She was rather tall, bent, and in black clothes from head to feet. As soon as the woman disappeared into the alley, I took a chance and started pounding my rubber soles in her direction. The alley was empty when I reached it. There was no way she could have reached the opposite end of the alley before I got to this one. Along both sides of the alley were the rear doors of apartment buildings, each one of them looking blankly at me. The others in our party arrived shortly after, and I sent them back out to drive through the streets looking for the mysterious woman or stand watch on adjacent corners. I wasted time hunting for unlocked doors in the alley or open windows or even a fire escape showing signs of having been recently used. Bungled it again! I won't pay your agency a nickel! I see you brought Mr. Gatewood back with you. He kind of insisted. But I'll see that some of these so-called detectives get put back in uniform and set to walking a beat! Mr. Gatewood, what did the woman look like? I don't know! I thought you were hanging around to take care of her! She was old and bent, I guess, but I couldn't see her face for her veil. I don't know! What the hell were you men doing? It's a damned outrage the way you've been handling this, why am I? I finally got him quieted down and took him home. Ogar and Thode had assigned 14 or 15 men to keep the neighborhood under surveillance. I wanted to be at the Gatewood home when the girl was released. She'd naturally head for home when that happened, and I wanted to question her. If she could tell us anything about her abductors, there was a better chance of catching them before they got very far. I kept one ear for the telephone, the other for the front door. The only calls were from the police detectives asking if we'd heard from the girl. Then, at about 9 o'clock, Thode and Ogar with Lusk arrived at the house to tell us that the woman in black had been a man and he had gotten away. Rear of one of the apartment buildings that touches the alley, we found a woman's skirt, coat, hat, and veil, all black. Super said that an apartment had been rented three days ago to a young man named Der, uh, Leighton. Nope. Found a lot of cold cigarette butts, an empty bottle... Yeah, nothing else that hadn't already been there when he rented it. So it looks like this Leighton character had rented the apartment so he could have access to the building. He probably wore the dame's duds over his own, slipped out the back door, leaving it unlatched, and met up with Gatewood. Then he runs back into the building, sheds his disguise, and out the front door he goes, knowing we ain't looking for a guy. And before we'd cast our net such as it was. What does this fellow look like, according to the super? Yeah, let's see. He's about 30. Slender, about 5 feet 8 or 9. Dark hair, eyes. His super said he's good-looking and was dressed, he, the last time he saw him, in a brown suit and light brown felt hat. Was there any sort of indication, any possibility, that the Gatewood girl had been held in Layton's apartment? We thought of that and looked the place over for some sign of it. And there wasn't anything to show the girl had been there. Nothing. Ten a.m. came and no word from the girl. By this time, the suspense and the liquor he'd consumed had all but finished Mr. Gatewood. He'd lost his domineering bullheadedness and was breaking up. I didn't like the man personally, nor his reputation, but that didn't prevent me from feeling sorry for him in the moment. I called up the agency and spoke to the old man, asking him for the reports from the operatives who had been looking up the friends of Audrey Gatewood. 
the last person to have seen Miss Gatewood seems to have been an Agnes Dangerfield, who had apparently seen her walking down Market Street near 6th alone on the night of her abduction. Said glimpse was made sometime between 8.15 and 8.45 p.m. Miss Dangerfield said she was not close enough to the Gatewood girl to speak to her. That's how the old man talks. Two or three decades of sleuthing have burned all the emotion out of him. He looks like a kindly old history professor with white hair and spectacles and a trimmed mustache. But there's a marvelous brain at work behind those mild eyes. Thanks. Was there anything else? Nothing, except the girl is a wild, spoiled youngster who hasn't shown very great care in selecting her friends. Yeah, just the sort of girl who could easily fall into the hands of mobsters. Very likely. That was all the old man had to say about it, so I hung up. Noon arrived. No sign of the girl. We released the story to the newspapers, along with the new developments of the past few hours. What, what do you think is keeping her away? Don't you worry, Mr. Gatewood. I'm sure she'll be home um, before long. Uh, uh. I got out of there in a hurry because I had a hunch that I wanted to follow but also because when Gatewood had looked up at me and asked that question, I'd never have recognized him if I hadn't seen the change take place. I gave him those vague assurances because I didn't have the heart to tell him what I was beginning to suspect now that the money had been paid and she'd failed to show up. Catching a streetcar, I followed my hunch to the shopping district, wasting shoe leather at the five largest department stores, asking if a man answering Layton's description had been in buying clothes that might fit Audrey Gatewood. Failing to get any results, I went across the bay to try the Oakland stores. At the first one, I got action. Why, yes. A young man, very much like the one you describe, was in here yesterday, buying everything from lingerie to a cloak. Yes, quite a number of articles. Based on your description of the young woman, they would have easily fit her. Did he have anybody helping him carry the goods out? Oh, no. He asked us to deliver them. Is that so? Mm, yes. To an address here in Oakland, I believe. I'll get it for you. My luck was hitting on all cylinders. The sales clerk told me that the young man in question had had his purchases delivered to a Mr. T. Offered at an address on 14th Street. This turned out to be an apartment house. Yes? Do you know where I can find the manager? I'm the manager. Uh, step inside. Thank you. My card? I'm from the bonding department of the North American Casualty Company. Mr. Offord has apparently applied for a bond, and I'm stopping by to ask if you think he's all right, so far as you know. A bond? That's funny. He, he's going away tomorrow. Now, I was neither an employee of the North American Casualty Company nor from their bonding department. It was one of many such business cards I had ready to show people to get my foot in the door. This news that Offord was leaving the next day wasn't a huge surprise, so I kept up the act. Well, I can't say what the bond is for. We investigators just get the names and addresses. It may be for his present employer, or perhaps the man he's going to work for, wherever he's going, has applied for it. You see? Mr. Offord, so far as I know, is a very nice young man, but he has been here only a week. Not staying long, then? No, they came here from Denver, but the low altitude doesn't agree with Mrs. Offord, so they're going back. Are you sure they came from Denver? Well, they told me they did. How many of them are there? Only the two. They're young people. You strike me as a woman of shrewd judgment. How do they impress you? Hmm. Well, they seem to be a nice young couple. You'd hardly know they were in their apartment most of the time. They're so quiet. I'm sorry they can't stay. Do they go out much? Oh, I really don't know. They have their own keys, and unless I should happen to pass them going in or out, I'd never see them. Then, as a matter of fact, you couldn't say whether or not they stayed away all night some nights, could you? The lady eyed me doubtfully. I was stepping way over my pretext now, but I didn't think it mattered. She shook her head and said, No, I couldn't say. They have many visitors? I don't know. Mr. Offord is not... A man came in quietly from the street at that moment, brushed past me, and started to mount the steps to the second floor. 
Oh, dear. I hope he didn't hear me talking about him. But that's Mr. Offord. A slender man in brown with a light brown hat. He could be Leighton. I'd only seen his back when he'd gone past, and he'd seen only mine. I watched him as he climbed the stairs. If he had heard the manager mention his name, he'd use the turn at the head of the stairs to sneak a look at me. He did. I kept my face blank, but I knew him. Penny Quayle, a con man who'd been active on the East Coast four or five years before. His face was as expressionless as mine, but he knew me. I think I'll go up and talk to Mr. Offord. Coming silently to the door to apartment 202, I listened. Not a sound. This was no time for hesitation. The three bullets that came through the door at waist height would have been in my fat carcass if I hadn't learned years ago to stand to one side of strange doors when making uninvited calls. Cut it, Audrey. For God's sake, not that kid. Go to hell, Penny! He can go to hell, too! Let's go! Stop. No, no! Get your damn hands off me, you coward! I could hear the happy couple scuffling inside. The last gunshot didn't come through the door, but it may have gone into one of the people in the room. I hurled my foot against the door near the knob, and the lock broke away. Inside the room, Quayle and a woman, whom I assumed was Miss Gatewood, were tussling. He was bending over her, holding her wrists. A smoking automatic pistol was in her right hand. I got to it in a jump and tore it loose. That's enough. Get up and receive company. Christ, I think she nearly tore off my ear. I suppose you think you've raised hell. <laughs> if your father is in his right mind, he'll do the hell raising with a razor strop when he gets you home again. This is a fine joke you picked out to play on him. <laughs> if you'd been tied to him as long as I have and had been bullied and held down as much, I guess you'd do most anything to get enough money so you could go away and live your own life. I didn't say anything to that. Audrey Gatewood was her father's daughter for certain. That's the worst that could be said, considering some of the business methods Harvey Gatewood had used, particularly some of his war contracts that the Department of Justice was still investigating. How'd you rap to it? Several ways. First, I'm a little doubtful about grown persons being kidnapped in cities. Maybe it really happens sometimes, but at least nine-tenths of the cases you hear about are fakes. Second, one of Audrey's friends saw her on Market Street between 8.15 and 8.45, the night she disappeared. And your letter to her father was postmarked 9 p.m. Pretty fast work, eh? You should have waited a while before mailing it, even if it had to miss the first morning delivery. I suppose she dropped it in the post office on her way over here? Uh-huh. Then, third, there was that phone call of hers. She knew it took anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes to get her father on the wire at the office. If she'd really been imprisoned, she would have told her story to the first person she got hold of, one of the switchboard girls most likely. So that made it look as if, besides wanting to throw out that Twin Peaks line, she wanted to stir her father out of his bullheadedness. When you failed to show up after the money was paid, Miss Gatewood, I figured it as a sure bet that you'd kidnapped yourself. I knew that if you came back after faking this thing, we'd find it out before we talked to you very long. And I figured you knew that too, and that's why you stayed away. The rest was just good breaks and honest detective work. Yeah, I was damn careless. Yeah, but what can you expect? She's had a skin full of hop ever since we started. Took all my time and attention keeping her from running wild and coming up the works. Just now as a sample, I told her you were coming up and she goes crazy and tries to add your corpse to the wreck. The Gatewood reunion was a merry little party. There in the Oakland City Hall, it was a toss-up whether Harvey Gatewood would die of apoplexy, strangle his daughter, or send her off to the state reformatory until she was 21. But Audrey beat him. Daddy... If you don't simply forget that this whole thing ever happened, I'll use what I know about you and your shady business dealings. I'll send everything to the Chronicle and the Examiner and let them fight over your scalp. Audrey, you wouldn't. Don't press your luck, father. All right. <clears throat> let's, let's go home. And so they left for home, sweating hate for each other out of every pore. 
I don't know what she had on him, and I don't think he was any too sure himself. But with his war contracts being investigated at the time, he couldn't afford to take a chance. We took Quayle upstairs and put him in a cell, but he was too experienced to let that worry him. He knew that if the girl was to be spared, he himself couldn't very easily be convicted of anything. have been listening to The Gatewood Caper, Episode 2 of Adventures of the Federated Tech. Our cast consisted of the following players. John Bell as Mr. Gatewood and the man calling up. Pete Lutz as the Federated Tech. Jerry Eliff as the maid and the apartment manager. Jason D. Johnson as Sergeant O'Gar. Mark Kalita as Detective Thode. Angela Young as Audrey Gatewood. Paul Arbisi as Inspector Lusk. Joe Stofko as the old man, Frank Guglielmelli as the salesperson, and Jeff Moon as the telephone voice and Penny Quayle. Incidental music and our theme was composed and performed by Dr. Ross Bernhardt. The Gatewood Caper was originally published under the title Crooked Souls and was written by Dashiell Hammett. It appeared in the October 1st, 1923 issue of Black Mask Magazine. Mixing and mastering were performed by Daniel French of Fishbonius Productions. This program was produced under the supervision of Pete Lutz. This is Rich Wentworth speaking. Join us again soon for Episode 3, Slippery Fingers. Sixty-three audio. Eighty-eight. Reduction.